uh, former Homeland Security intelligence uh, officials, uh, as well as national security and civil rights experts on their views of the uh, appropriate roles, responsibilities, and authorities uh, for the Department of Homeland Security's Office of Intelligence uh, and Analysis. I would like to thank each of our witnesses uh, for joining us today and for their work in the public and private sectors to protect the American people. Today's testimony will give the committee critical insight into how the Office of Intelligence uh, and Analysis operates and what roles uh, it should play in providing threat assessment and domestic terrorism intelligence to Department of Homeland Security leadership, state and local law enforcement partners, and other private entities. We will also hear testimony on how to ensure citizens' fundamental civil rights and civil liberties are safeguarded as we work to better tackle a rising domestic terrorism threat. Earlier this year, the committee heard about how systemic breakdowns in planning and preparation led to the deadly attack on the United States Capitol, the heart of our democracy. The Office of Intelligence and Analysis, along with other intelligence and counterterrorism agencies, failed to effectively identify the threat on January 6th. We need to understand the factors that led to that failure and what concrete steps can be taken to better understand the current threats that we face and ensure the Department of Homeland Security is effectively sharing information with local and state law enforcement. I appreciate the hard work and the ongoing dedication of the national security experts in the Office of Intelligence and Analysis, and I recognize they have challenges the, and face challenges that they, may, they, they must address. However, it is apparent that the office must also do more to effectively counter the rising th threats posed by white supremacists and anti-government violence that threatens communities all across our country. One of the greatest challenges the Office of Intelligence and Analysis has faced is the pressure to politicize domestic terrorism threats. Under the previous administration, the office re reportedly downplayed the threat posed by white supremacists and anti-government violence and reportedly censored some intelligence information under pressure from President Trump. At times, this political pressure led to problematic and inaccurate analysis related to peaceful protest movements, overstating the roles of certain groups, and even reportedly developing intelligence on American journalists. Our national security and the safety of Americans cannot depend on political whims or individual leaders' biases. That is why Congress must work to ensure that analysis conducted by the intelligence community is separated from the political environment and based in facts and in data that accurately assess security threats. The office also struggles with employee morale, a challenge identified by the Government Accountability Office uh, reports uh, that and employee surveys, possibly because of a lack of consistent leadership and direction. Since this office was first created 19 years ago, it has had more than a dozen different leaders. Only three of those individuals, including one of our witnesses today, led the office for more than two years. These obstacles and other challenges must be addressed quickly. Our nation faces very real and deadly domestic terrorism threats, and our national security agencies must ensure that our counterterrorism efforts and resources align with those threats. A recent long-delayed joint report from the FBI and DHS identified racially or ethnically motivated extremists, primarily white supremacists, as the most significant national security threat based on data from recent years. And while I appreciate the initial steps the Biden administration has taken to begin addressing the alarming rise of these threats, it's clear that there is so much more work to be done. American lives are at risk, and we must ensure that we are taking all, all appropriate action to safeguard the American people and protect their fundamental rights as well. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses uh, who bring unique perspectives on how we can improve the Office of Intelligence and Analysis to meet our security goals. I have no doubt 
that this committee can work in a nonpartisan way to strengthen our homeland security and protect Americans from all threats, both foreign and domestic. With that, I turn it over to Ranking Member Portman uh, for your opening comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you uh, for holding this hearing. It's important and timely for us to learn more about uh, what the Homeland Security's Office of Intelligence and Analysis does and how to ensure that they're doing their job better. Uh, DHS is responsible for protecting the homeland, and I believe its intelligence and analysis capabilities are absolutely essential to that effort. So uh, let me just start by saying I think the role that's being played uh, is, is critical, and I look forward to discussing how to best equip the department and its partners with critical, timely, and actionable intelligence to keep us safe from both foreign and domestic adversaries. Um, and there's plenty of challenges right now. The events of January 6th have just been talked about, domestic terrorism, recent attacks on federal facilities and law enforcement, Mexican and other foreign cartel networks that are now operating, uh, much more so as I understand it, uh, within our cities. The ongoing threat, of course, posed by foreign terrorists, all this underscores the need for ongoing intelligence and analysis focused on identifying and mitigating threats to our country. Since its inception, DHS has had an intelligence office to support its mission, uh, understandably. Congress underscored the importance of intelligence and information sharing in the implementing recommendations from the 9-11 Commission. This was back in 2007, and that formally established the Office of Intelligence and Analysis. While it's one of the smaller entities within the, in the IC community, the intelligence community, INA is the only IC member charged with delivering intelligence to our local, our state, our tribal, our territorial, and our private sector partners, and developing intelligence from these important partners for the department and for the intelligence community. So to put it simply, INA is intended to facilitate a key layer of communication and domestic coordination required, in my view, to help support the effort of DHS to protect the homeland. In my home state of Ohio, we have three fusion centers that have benefited greatly from the partnership with INA. I've visited one of them a couple of times, the Cincinnati Fusion Center, where I have seen the importance of the support and the partnership that, a, that INA provides. For example, I recently learned that an INA intelligence officer at one of our fusion centers in Columbus, Ohio, provided critical information on a suspect who had a plot to cause mass violence at a large music concert venue in Columbus. By leveraging INA's capabilities, the Columbus Fusion Center was able to quickly work with law enforcement to locate that suspect and place this individual on TSA's no-fly list. The suspect was then in intercepted while attempting to board a flight on his way to Columbus to carry out the attack. That's an example, one example, but there are many like that where INA has, uh, INA has played a critical role. Uh, the committee learned from our oversight investigation into the January 6th attack on the Capitol that INA fell short in reporting on the potential threat. They weren't the only ones, uh, but they did fall short in my view. Security officials have cited the lack of intelligence and information sharing from INA and other intelligence agencies as a reason law enforcement was not better prepared to respond. In our investigation, the then acting undersecretary for INA revealed weaknesses in how INA distributes information, collects intelligence from social media platforms, and leverages its relationship with state, local, tribal, and territorial, and private sector partners to learn of new evolving threats. And that will be part of the report that we will be issuing here in the next few weeks. Notably, INA has an important role to play in combating transnational criminal organizations, so-called TCOs including those responsible for drug trafficking, violence, human smuggling, child exploitation, and a host of other criminal activities. As I said earlier, TCOs uh, are increasingly present here in this country. They're always evolving. They're always adapting to maximize their profits, as they, as they did as COVID-19 reshaped supply chains and transport patterns. In fact, according to the DEA, the Drug Enforcement Administration, once they adjusted to the initial disruption of COVID, Mexican cartels, quote, reinforced supplies of precursor materials, increased production, and are sending 
larger fentanyl and methamphetamine loads into the United States. Uh, we certainly see that at the Mexican border. It seems more important than ever for federal and local partners to be in close coordination to understand and combat these dynamic threats. And while these challenges are national, they have hit local communities, including many in my home state of Ohio, particularly hard. There are a number of issues I hope we were able to explore today. There are differing opinions on what INA's role is with regard to intelligence collection, production, and dissemination. In my view, having timely quality intelligence is an essential component, again, to keep our communities safe. Hope today we can talk about how DHS can appropriately provide these capabilities at a time when we face some threats that are homegrown. The threats we face are dynamic and becoming more complex every day, and they aren't all focused on Washington, D.C. Considering the current environment, how can INA best leverage those fusion centers we talked about and its partnership with state, local, and private sector partners to meet the needs of the department charged with securing our homeland? Finally, over the years, INA has faced challenges in recruiting qualified talent and has experienced consistently low morale and high rates of attrition. This is a deep concern of mine. I hope our witnesses can help us understand what can be done to address these longstanding personnel issues. So General Taylor, Ms. Cogswell, Mr. Sena, and Ms. Patel, I'm looking forward to your testimony and some answers to those questions we posed today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ranking Member Parman, uh, for your opening uh, comments. Um, it is the uh, practice of the Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee to swear in witnesses. So uh, if our uh, witnesses will please stand and raise your right hand, and uh, our witnesses who are on video, uh, raise your right hand so we can see you uh, on, the, on the video. Uh, do you swear uh, that the testimony you will give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Witnesses may be seated. Our first uh, witness today is General Francis Taylor, the former Undersecretary for Intelligence and Analysis at the Department of Homeland Security. Prior to his assignment at DHS INA, General Taylor was Vice President and Chief Security Officer for the General Electric Company. General Taylor has also served as the Assistant Secretary of State for Diplomatic Security and Director of the Office of Foreign Missions with the rank of Ambassador. General Taylor also previously served in the US, uh, as the U.S. Ambassador at Large and Coordinator for Counterterrorism for the Department of State from July 2001 to November 2002. Prior to that, General Taylor accumulated uh, 31 years of military experience, rising to the rank of Brigadier General. Mr. Taylor, or, uh, former General, General Taylor, welcome uh, to the uh, committee. Uh, you are recognized uh, for your uh, five uh, minutes uh, opening remarks. I'm having, there it goes. Uh, Chairman Peters, uh, Ranking Member Portman, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to talk about the uh, DHS Office of Intelligence and Analysis. I've submitted uh, written testimony and would ask that that be entered into the record, and I will try to summarize that in my five minutes uh, this morning. INA's mission is integral to DHS, the intelligence community, and to the security of our nation. It is the only U.S. intelligence agency that is specifically chartered to provide intelligence support to state, local, tribal, territorial, and private sector partners to improve the flow and quality of information sharing across our nation. As the intelligence arm of, the, of DHS, INA has a responsibility to support the intelligence needs of the senior leadership of the department, to ensure relevant intelligence from the IC is shared systematically with our state, local, tribal, territorial, and private sector partners, and that relevant information from those partners becomes intelligence that is shared more broadly with the IC. As the chief intelligence officer for the department, the undersecretary for INA coordinates and deconflicts the efforts of the DHS intelligence enterprise to meet the intelligence needs of the department and our IC partners. Additionally, the Undersecretary's responsibility to lead information sharing and safeguarding uh, for the department provides a unique opportunity to use the myriad of data generated by DHS and to turn that data into effective information to share with our SLTT, federal, 
and international partners. There are several initiatives that I believe INA leadership must focus on. First, restoring trust. INA leaders will need to focus on rebuilding trust with key stakeholders within and across DHS and the intelligence enterprise, as well as externally with broader IC, with the IC and Congress. Controversies surrounding INA activities and the use of intelligence authorities in recent years have undermined its reputation and raised questions about the integrity and objectivity of the information it provides to stakeholders. In order to rebuild stakeholder and public trust, INA will need to focus on advancing its core mission and demonstrating that it brings value, invaluable mission expertise to, the, to its customers. Second, focus on SLTT and private sector partners. Moving forward, INA should focus on effective prioritization of its information sharing activities, ensuring that they meet the needs of state and local law enforcement and yield intelligence information that could be useful to the broader IC as a complement, not as a competitor of the FBI. Likewise, INA should continue to engage its partners in private industry to gain perspective on national and homeland security challenges facing the sector and ways to facilitate public-private partnerships. Third, reinvent intelligence analysis for DHS and the IC. INA leaders should focus on the office's intelligence analysis activities and creation of intelligence products that draw upon unique DHS data sets and data science with a robust framework for privacy and civil liberties. INA can be a leading player in government focusing on data science to create unique insights and produce clearly di differentiated intelligence products. With the access to special data sets and focused on a set of priorities, INA can lead the IC in re reinventing how DHS does intelligence. I believe the Mission Center concept that was established by the most recent uh, Undersecretary is a great idea and needs to be further developed within INA and within the DHS IE. They should, INA should create a budget, annual strategy, metrics, and fully restore resource each mission center to appropriately support the needs of the intelligence enterprise, components, the department leadership, and the broader IC. Finally, INA should lead in data analytics using unique data generated by the department DHS generates a tremendous amount of relevant information as daily mission activities. And uh, when I was there, that information was sat in more than 900 mutually independent databases. Uh, that needs to change. Finally, uh, as Senator Portman and uh, Senator Peters mentioned, we need to invest in our workforce. And I'd be happy to talk about that and morale uh, during your questions. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Well, thank you, uh, General Taylor, for, uh, for your testimony. Our uh, second witness uh, today is Ms. Patricia Cogswell, former Deputy Administrator of the Transportation Security Administration. Ms. Cogswell is uh, currently a Senior Strategic Advisor for Guidehouse National Security Segment. Prior to serving as Deputy TSA Administrator, Ms. Cogswell, long and distinguished career in public service included leading programs at the White House, Department of Homeland Security, and the Department of Justice related to intelligence, information sharing, border security, screening and watch listing, and aviation, maritime, and surface transportation. Ms. Cogswell, welcome to the committee. Uh, you are recognized uh, for your opening statement. Thank you, sir. Chairman Peters, Ranking Member Portman, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify for you, before you this morning. As you examine the role of DHS's Office of Intelligence and Analysis, my comments for the committee today are informed by my more than 24 years of career federal civilian service and from the various capacities in which I have both led and worked with DHS INA. During my tenure, I served in multiple DHS leadership roles, including with three different headquarters elements and three different DHS component agencies, as well as a three-year tour at the National Security Council. 
When I served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Screening Coordination, a Special Assistant to the President for Transborder Security at the National Security Council, and most recently at the deputy, as the Deputy Administrator for TSA, I was a consumer of DHS INA's intelligence products. While at DHS Policy, another headquarters office, I partnered with DHS INA to lead development of interagency strategic and policy initiatives, collaborate on reports for the Secretary and other DHS leaders, and to lead DHS governance processes. As the Assistant Director for Intelligence at Immigration and Customs Enforcement, I was a member of the Homeland Security Intelligence Council, working with DHS INA to inform strategic direction, policy, priorities, requirements, and production. And finally, I led DHS INA, serving as the acting undersecretary while the nominee was undergoing confirmation. During my time, I found the highest value roles for DHS INA to be supporting the Homeland Security Intelligence Enterprise, the undersecretary as the chief intelligence officer in collaboration with the HISIC, Homeland Security Intelligence Council, should lead development of strategy, policy, and an integrated set of priorities, including training and budget. Advocating for the DHS mission, to the intelligence community, and through associated budget processes. DHS INA should advocate on behalf of operators and policy personnel for prioritization of intelligence collection, access to IC information, use of IC information sharing platforms and tools, and associated resources. Providing the secretary, deputy secretary, and headquarters organizations with intelligence services. Ensuring that headquarters offices and the secretary have access to the same high quality intelligence as their counterparts do, particularly in advance of interagency and policy meetings. Coordinating production of sense of community analysis to support DHS and Homeland Security unique needs in coordination with the HISIC. In addition to products like the Homeland Security Threat Assessment, the CINT should support development of sense of community products to support policy and operational decisions. Development of individual products should be by the DHS entity best positioned to speak on behalf of the entirety of the information, including not only traditional intelligence and law enforcement information, but also analysis developed by DHS in support of its ongoing programs and other knowledgeable stakeholders, including academia and associations, that the products are scoped to answer relevant questions for the conversations. Engaging the fusion centers, DHS INA should support state, local, territorial, tar and tribal partners with training, information, and all source analysis that helps those partners based on the partner needs, and collaborating with other DHS entities to enable an effective information sharing environment. DHS INA should support the design and funding of technical architectures and multi-use tools that enhance DHS's ability to match and exchange information where appropriate to achieve their missions in collaboration with the operating components and other headquarters offices. DHS INA should work to ensure it can perform effectively across these functions with variants in approach based on the needs and capabilities of its partners. To do so, DHS INA needs to examine staffing and morale, including, in particular, stabilizing its organizational structure, mission, and role. The workforce needs consistency and continuity, something that lasts beyond the tenure of a single undersecretary, as well as a mission that is unique and valued where they can be recognized as having subject matter experts and are seen as partners. Enhancing career development opportunities, DHS INA leadership should invest in changes that will provide supervisors incentives to positively coach and mentor their personnel and career paths that enable staff to grow, including mobility to DHS agencies, increasing their opportunities and exposure to the wider Homeland Security mission. Depoliticizing products and career staff, DHS INA should enhance its strategic communications with its customers and stakeholders, providing the opportunity to, for input into INA's analytic product selection process, methodology, data used, how it's assessed, and ensure that it seeks out support from partners and oversight, including this committee, for efforts in areas that may become controversial. As this committee examines DHS INA's role, I would encourage you to consider how to develop changes in a way that will support the organization for years to come. Organizational, transformational, and cultural change take investment in time, developing talent, a willingness to measure impact and modify activity based on those results, and a commitment to strategic communications. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify before you today. I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you, Ms. Cogswell. Cogswell. 
Our next uh, witness uh, is uh, Mr. Mike Senna. Uh, Mr. Senna serves as the president of the National Fusion Center Association, which represents state and major urban area fusion centers. These centers work to enhance public safety and encourage effective, efficient, ethical, lawful, and professional intelligence and information sharing, and prevent and reduce the harmful effects of crime and terrorism on victims and communities. In addition to his leadership positions, Mr. Senna serves on law enforcement and Homeland Security Advisory Committees for the members of the President's Cabinet, the Department of Homeland Security, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and the Attorney General of the United States. Uh, Mr. Senna, welcome uh, to the hearing. Uh, you may proceed uh, with your opening comments. Thank you, Chairman Peters and uh, Ranking Member Portman and members of the committee. I appreciate the invitation to be with you today. My name is Mike Senna, and I'm the director of the Northern California Regional Intelligence Center, the NICRIC, and the president of the National Fusion Center Association, the NFCA. The NFCA represents the interest of 80 state and locally owned and managed fusion centers with over 3,000 public safety employees. We refer to all 80 centers together as the National Network of Fusion Centers. Fusion centers assist in the identification, prevention, mitigation, response, and recovery of terrorist acts and other major criminal threats. We depend on DHS INA as the only U.S. Intelligence Committee element that is statutorily charged with supporting our network. A locally integrated and engaged INA is critical to enhancing capacity among fusion centers and our partners to analyze and share threat-related information that is relevant and timely. We're offering several concrete recommendations that would help ensure INA is able to maximize its potential capacity to protect the homeland. INA must increase the forward deployment of well-trained and experienced personnel to fusion centers. They must offer high quality training on analytical tradecraft and on privacy, civil rights, and civil liberties. They must invest in modernizing information sharing systems and technologies. They must also ensure reliable access to critical data, including criminal justice information and classified data. And finally, they must be empowered to have direct coordination authority of DHS resources that are allocated to support fusion centers. Having INA's partner engagement function, which is routinely uh, coordinating with us um, and having them report directly to the INA Undersecretary and Principal Dep Deputy would be helpful in facilitating this. Some fusion centers do not have any INA presence and some others have part-time INA personnel. Currently, INA only has a little more than 100 personnel deployed across the nation. From our perspective, that is simply not sufficient. We strongly encourage Congress to support increased funding for INA to ensure that it can hire, train, and deploy an adequate number of personnel across the nation. The mo more than two thirds of all the funding that supports fusion centers comes from state and local budgets. DHS grant funding is another critical source of support that primarily comes through our Urban Area Security Initiative and state Homeland Security grant programs. Some centers are almost entirely grant funded and some receive almost no grant funding. Some fusion centers provide operational support at the request of public safety partners, including the FBI's Joint Terrorism Task Force. But in some cases, FEMA has limited or denied the ability for fusion centers to use grant funds to provide that support. We must find better ways to reduce bureaucracy and improve efficient authorization of grant funding in a timely manner. INA should be empowered to coordinate with FEMA's grant personnel to ensure that grant guidance and funding are more closely aligned with the needs of federal, state, territorial, and local public safety partners. Access to information systems is critical to the successful operations of our fusion centers. But some centers still lack access to critical databases like the FBI's criminal justice services and the Treasury's financial crimes enforcement network system. The National Data Exchange, NDEX, brings together over 7,700 agencies' record systems, but we have over 18,000 agencies in America. Most agencies are not connected to this critical resource and some fusion centers do not have access. Fusion centers should be equipped to help protect everyone in America, regardless of where they are. INA can play a supportive role by working with their federal partners to ensure appropriate access to federal systems by state and local partners. INA should continue to support the development and enhancement of existing systems, including the Homeland Security Information Network, HISN, and work with us to identify and deploy more advanced technology. The HISN platforms are essential and trusted fusion center tools. The NFC established the HISN sit room for sharing information on physical threats and the Cyber Intelligence Network, uh, SIN, uh, room supports cyber threat collaboration for over 500 cyber analysts across the country. INA should continue to support fusion center cyber capabilities by providing access to critical cyber analysis tools and increasing training opportunities. Right now, fusion centers, the regional information sharing systems, Western States Information Network, 
and the FBI's National Threat Operations Center are analyzing data and sharing information on reported threats to life through HISN, the FBI's eGuardian system, and directly with local and public safety agencies. The Criminal Intelligence Coordinating Council and Global Advisory Committee are also writing recommendations for managing tips, leads, and threat to life reporting. We need DHS INA resources to support this effort to mitigate the immediate threats to our communities. In summary, strengthening INA's capabilities to support the network and the nation will require some uh, them to reorient their focus. Their focus must be on the H and DHS and the state, local, tribal, and territorial partners that are the heart of protecting our homeland. The recommendations I mentioned a minute ago would help DHS INA support the national network in ways that are most relevant and helpful to our members and our partners across the nation. On behalf of the NFCA, I'd like to thank you for the invitation to testify and I look forward to your questions. Well, thank you, Mr. Nyan for uh, your testimony. Our uh, final witness today is Ms. Faiza Patel, a director of the Liberty and National Security Program at New York University School of Law's Brennan Center for Justice. Ms. Patel has previously testified before Congress regarding the government's surveillance of Muslim and Arab Americans following the September 11th attacks and has organized advocacy efforts against discriminatory state laws. She also helped establish an independent inspector general for the New York Police Department. And prior to joining the Brennan Center, Ms. Patel worked as a senior policy officer at the Organization for Prohibition of Chemical Weapons in The Hague and clerked for the judge at the International Criminal Tribunal in the former Yugoslavia. Welcome, Ms. Patel. Uh, you are recognized uh, for your five-minute opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Peters, Ranking Member Portman, and members of the committee. I'm really happy to be here testifying today. Um, as our country faces up to the persistent problem of white supremacist and far-right violence, as well as a range of other threats, INA has the potential to play a constructive role in providing accurate and unbiased intelligence to help guide the response. The office has great influence because it sits at the center of a web of intelligence and law enforcement agencies spread throughout the country. In light of its influence, it is critically important that INA's output and advice meet the highest standards of respect for American civil rights and civil liberties. This is especially true when it comes to domestic intelligence, which presents unique threats because of its obvious overlap with protected political speech and organizing. INA is, of course, prohibited from collecting or disseminating information based solely on First Amendment protected activities, but it has in the past targeted Muslim Americans for little apparent reason other than their religion, as well as protesters. Last summer, as racial justice demonstrations triggered by the killing of George Floyd broke out across the country, INA led the expansion of intelligence activities under the guise of protecting federal courthouses. INA staff were directed to collect information both about matters that can be reasonably considered threats to homeland security, but also matters that are traditionally handled by local authorities as part of their public safety mandate. According to the Washington Post, INA even had access to protesters' communications on Telegram, which is not allowed by its guidelines, um, and these were written up in an intelligence report disseminated to its network. And the office circulated three intelligence reports summarizing tweets written by the editor of a legal blog and a reporter for the New York Times. It's particularly critical that INA gets its house in order as DHS pivots to confront the threat of domestic terrorism. Secretary Mayorkas has designated domestic violent extremism as a priority area and has created a team within INA to focus on this threat. Based on testimony and reports in the press, it seems that INA will be looking at American social media postings to identify narratives and grievances to gauge their prevalence and to see if they may influence acts of violence. I am concerned that this focus is likely to be both ineffective and invasive sweeping in reams of information, including about constitutionally protected activities. Targeting what people say online is unlikely to be effective in identifying violent actors. The reason is pretty simple. Large numbers of people believe in the types of narratives that DHS has already identified as drivers of violence in its January 27th bulletin. Anti-immigrant sentiment has a long history in the US. Many people believe that measures taken to control COVID-19 infringe on their freedoms. Many Americans dispute the results of the 2020 elections, and police use of force against African Americans triggered demonstrations across the country. We can argue about whether the people who hold these views are right or wrong, but they are hardly a way of distinguishing potentially violent actors. 
In technical terms, this method is highly sensitive, but it is not specific to the threat of violence. The acting undersecretary of INA recently acknowledged this fact, noting that it is difficult to discern actual intent to carry out violence from angry and hyperbolic speech on the internet. This is supported by years of research, which showed the difficulty of interpreting social media posts without context or knowledge of the conventions in particular communities or platforms. DHS of all agencies should know the limits of social media to find threats. According to its own internal documents, social media monitoring pilot programs for visa vetting did not help in finding security threats. The people charged with running these programs said that they were not able to reliably match accounts to people, and even when they were, they weren't able to determine the context and reliability of what they saw. To address the concerns I have outlined, I think it is critical to strengthen INA's civil rights and civil liberty safeguards and oversight over its functions. I have four recommendations. First, given social media centrality to political discourse and the difficulty of identifying threats online, INA should reconsider its plans to monitor these platforms for narratives and grievances. At a minimum, it should explain how it intends to ensure that it is focused on identifying violent actors rather than simply keeping tabs on what Americans say on the internet. Second, oversight needs to be strengthened. Uh, this hearing obviously is a great example, uh, but DHS also has a dedicated Office of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties and a Privacy Office. Their role in clearing INA analyses was eliminated last year and should be restored. Congress should consider mechanisms for ensuring that these types of critical oversight functions cannot be so easily sidelined in the future. Regular audits can also help ensure that leadership has a holistic view. Lastly, we need to pay attention to the enormous amount of information on Americans that's contained in DHS databases. Former DHS officials have said that this level of information and raises privacy and due process concerns that dwarf those arising out of the NSA programs. Uh, this would be an appropriate topic of inquiry for the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, in my opinion. Thank you again for the opportunity. I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Thank Patel, you. Uh, for, uh, for your opening uh, statement. General uh, Taylor, in uh, last year's Homeland Threat Assessment, DHS uh, stated that domestic violent extremism, specifically white supremacist extremists, are the most persistent and lethal homeland security threat. Uh, that is a finding uh, that both myself and uh, Ranking Member Portman uh, have been saying for, for some time now. And it's clear that this threat is, uh, is real, and it's clear that we need to combat it. So my question uh, to you is beyond establishing the domestic terrorism branch, which is certainly, I think we all agree, a step in the right uh, direction, are there other changes to INA's organization or authorities that you believe would help them address this threat? It's my view that uh, INA has the requisite authorities to address this threat uh, if it prioritizes that threat. Uh, and in the uh, last administration. Um, it's my understanding that domestic terrorism was not uh, considered a priority for INA. In fact, that the uh, INA leadership uh, kind of deferred to the FBI on that. So I think it's a, the authority exists. Uh, it's a focus on what the outcome is INA is trying to achieve and how they do that consistent with uh, privacy, civil rights, and civil liberties going forward. So your testimony is that it just was not prioritized. They have uh, the authorities uh, to, to do it. Uh, perhaps we drill down on that a little bit, uh, if we could, General. Uh, what, what, what do you see as the added value uh, that INA provides to the, uh, the broader federal intelligence uh, community and uh, partners uh, in combating this? What, what is the specific value that they, they could bring if sufficiently prior to prioritized? Yeah, you know, much of the work against uh, violent extremists occurs in the 18,000 police departments across our country. Local law enforcement confronts these individuals, uh, investigates these folks because they're committing acts in communities that those officers are sworn to protect. It's my view that through the fusion centers, um, INA and its intelligence officers can bring better perspective to the national level of what these 18,000 police organizations are seeing uh, trend-wise and uh, tactics, techniques, and procedure-wise in their communities. Uh, the FBI plays an 
extraordinarily important role in its JTTF, but as Director Ray has testified, there needs to be a definitive act uh, of violence for the FBI to get uh, involved. And I think that's the uh, gap that INA can help cover with its collection and production uh, in the field. Very good. Ms. Uh, Patel, um, question, the next question is uh, for you. Uh, as INA continues to attempt to better understand uh, and analyze uh, the real threat posed by domestic terrorism, could you share uh, with the, the committee uh, some of the concerns that communities of color in particular uh, are facing uh, with uh, the effort to combat domestic terrorism? Sure. Thank you for that question. Um, so for communities of color, when you have broad open um, intelligence gathering, um, authorities and programs, there is a risk that they will be the targets of those programs. And we've seen this sort of systematically over the last two decades where Muslim Americans have been targeted for surveillance often on the basis of nothing other than their religion. We've seen this with African American communities being targeted. Uh, we've seen the Black Lives Matter movement being targeted. I mean, this is you know, a pretty well known uh, phenomenon in the United States. So I think the overall concern is that domestic terrorism is discussed sort of almost as a stand in for white supremacist violence, but covers a much broader range of issues as we've seen from DHS and FBI documents. So the concern is that these kinds of uh, broad open surveillance programs will actually be used to target communities of color, as has been the case in the past. Very good. General, uh, General Taylor, uh, last year you uh, authored an op-ed noting your significant concern with INA's reportedly problematic intelligence operations uh, in Portland and the publishing of intelligence on, on journalists uh, specifically. Uh, more recently, this committee has found that INA warned generally uh, about the potential for election-related uh, violence, uh, but uh, failed to issue a warning specific to the, the risk facing the Capitol on uh, January 6. Uh, in both examples, uh, INA did not uh, clearly did not serve uh, its uh, customers uh, or the American people uh, in that respect. So, my question to you is: In your opinion, what are the key reasons for INA's failures? Uh, over this past year? It's hard for me, uh, Senator, to kind of focus in on uh, the key reasons for failure because I wasn't in the decision cycle. But I think organizations like INA uh, fail to meet their mission if they're not organized uh, in a way that ensures um, consistency of production, consistency of focus. And it's my understanding that those processes and procedures uh, that at least existed when I was there uh, were no longer being used uh, from an execution point of view. So I think solid leadership and solid management will um, save the day. By the way, I'm a, I'm a product of the Church Commission uh, and the follow-on from Counter and Tell Pro. Uh, I've been on the Privacy and Civil Rights, uh, Privacy and Civil Liberties uh, commission for President Bush. Um, this is fun. Privacy and civil rights and civil liberties are fundamental to how we should think about domestic inter ter uh, domestic intelligence. And for whatever reason, uh, that was not the case uh, during the last year. So when you talk about uh, stability continuity, I, I would assume uh, the fact that we've uh, had a lack of stability when it comes to INA leadership over the years, that has contributed to the problem that you see? I do. Uh, as you mentioned in your opening statement, 12 different uh, INA leaders over 19 years uh, really does not give you a, a lot of confidence about uh, continuity. Uh, and during my tenure, as has been my experience in the military, is when you take over an organization, you try to organize it to focus on the mission. Much of what we put in place uh, was dismantled uh, after we left office in 2017. Thank you, General. Ranking Member Portman, you, uh, you're recognized for your questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me just start, if I could, with uh, General Taylor and Ms. Cogswell. Um, you know, a fundamental question here. Both of you have a broad national security background, including having at one time had the role of uh, managing INA. Uh, do we need INA at DHS? Yes or no? Yes. 
agree as well. Okay. Uh, I think there's some fundamental rethinking going on right now, and I think it's important, in my view, that we have this intelligence gathering capability, particularly, as both of you commented on, uh, because our state and local and tribal and private sector coordination and communication goes through INA. Nobody else has that responsibility. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, one of my big concerns has been the, the growth of these uh, so-called TCO, the Transnational Criminal Organizations. They're responsible for a lot of criminal activity, as you know, but one that is particularly pernicious right now is the movement of drugs into our communities, particularly fentanyl uh, and the other syn synthetic opioids, which unfortunately killed more people uh, last year from everything we know than ever in our history. And um, they seem to be working their way into the system more. In other words, they, they're, they're more vertically integrated uh, in our communities themselves, not just bringing things across the border, as they're certainly doing. What, what are we doing with regard to INA and that issue? Um, are we thinking expansively enough when it comes to combating these uh, TCOs that have these tentacles in the communities around the country? What, what is your view, General Taylor? Senator Portman, I, I think that this is a problem for the entire DHS intelligence enterprise. Uh, the organization Ms. Cogswell led uh, in uh, ICE has a very important role to play mm -hmm. uh, in helping uh, state and local law enforcement as well as other federal partners uh, gather the intelligence that's necessary to disrupt these uh, mm -hmm. uh, talk uh, organizations going forward. So I don't think it's just INA, but it's how the intelligence enterprise is organized to support the investigation and field work of CBP, of ICE, of DEA uh, across the country is the important uh, role that INA plays in trying to coordinate that effort. How about the coordination with uh, those 18,000 police forces around the country? Isn't that a key role? Absolutely. And that's a part of understanding what is going on on the ground, what those priorities are, and sharing that information more broadly with uh, federal partners, not just uh, INA, but uh, with ICE and CBP, so we have a fuller picture of what's actually happening and how it can be interesting. Ms. Cogswell, your thoughts on TCOs? Uh, I do. Thank you very much. Um, as you noted, critically important topic for us. I, I would like to give one example to General Taylor's point uh, from when I was actually still there. We were extremely fortunate as the National Security Council began examining the transnational organized crime issue that they said, we want to look to have a law enforcement organization lead a whole of community effort to assess the threat across all the different dimensions that will help set the stage for us to have the right policy debate about how the U.S. government can take better and broader action. I was extremely fortunate that my team, um, my chief of staff at the time, was selected to lead the effort for the entire community with support of DHS INA, as well as other members of DHS, the Departments of Justice, and the intelligence community. I think that is a fantastic example of how the community comes together through these mechanisms to provide valuable intelligence that helps set direction for policy, whether additional legislation may be needed, where the resourcing is allocated. From what you know, and again, we don't have uh, the acting um, undersecretary here with us because we're not mixing the public and private panels, but from what you all know, and um, uh, those who are joining us virtually speak of as well, do you think that the current administration is focused enough on the TCO threat? I know it is, in fact, a priority for them and that there is work underway. And in particular, uh, I'm aware of some uh, very good discussions underway between DHS, INA, uh, the Office of Policy, and the operating components of DHS. Yeah. General? I agree. Uh, but, Senator Portman, one of the challenges uh, at INA, there are 700 people uh, in the entire organization. There are directorates of the CIA or DIA that have twice no. as many people. So uh, I think INA uh, is trying to satisfy as many customers as it can, but it doesn't have the resources to spread itself as wide as, as it needs to. And so one of the things I think uh, we should focus on is where should those priorities come from? Where's, where should those investments be made in resources yeah. uh, to prior towards well, I think that's a, that's a good point. That's one reason I'm asking you about this, because I, we've talked about domestic terrorism here. I, I assume we all agree that's important. But I think these TCOs are, uh, from what we know from um, open source information as well as others, 
that it, it's, it's growing and it, as, as a threat, and again, working its way as its tentacles into our communities. Um, you talked about the relatively small number of people compared to others in the IC community. We've got a real problem with attrition, too, and, and morale. And, um, you know, both of you have been consumers of the intelligence. You've also been there working with the individuals, as, and I want to hear from our other colleagues, too, who are on, on virtually. But, Ms. Cox, let me start, start with you quickly. W what do you think INA can do to deal with the consistently low morale and the lack of leadership? Um, and I, I would hope that the administration, by the way, would nominate somebody for that undersecretary slot right away and that we could get somebody in there who's willing to stick around for a while to provide some leadership. But I'd love to hear your comments on that. Uh, thank you very much. I agree with you that consistency and leadership that will be there for a period of time is critically important. Uh, I would also say that uh, assuming that this committee proceeds forward with some recommended changes, I know DHS will be considering them as well. I'm hopeful that those are built in a way that will, will, will pass the test of time, will frankly last for a period of years. Much like the reviews after 9-11, we looked at how various activities occurred in the intelligence community. I would hope similar activities would play themselves out at DHS-INA and frankly across the Homeland Security enterprise. Mm -hmm. Well, I think our, our, our report I mentioned earlier is gonna be helpful in that, in that regard as well. Let me just quickly end on one really comment, and it's a question, but we don't have time to get into it. I see a contradiction, and Ms. Patel, in some of the things you're uh, advocating and, and what others are advocating. We want more focus on domestic terrorism. We certainly have seen with regard to January 6th, we didn't have the information needed. It was online. Um, there was plenty of threats of violence that were actually, um, you know, followed through on. And yet, Ms. Patel, you seem to be saying we shouldn't rely on, on online information. It's unreliable. Uh, it's free speech. Um, and the violence that's threatened online doesn't necessarily mean it's really violence, but that, that seems contradictory to what our experience is. So can you comment on that quickly? And to the extent I don't have time, maybe you could get into that uh, in a second round. Ms. Patel, I think you're on mute, uh, Ms. Patel, if you could get off mute. Uh, mute. I'm, I'm not on mute from my side. Oh, you're good now. We can hear you now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I think we have to just define what we what we are looking for online. Um, I'm not saying by any means that we can never tell um, that violence is going to occur or criminal activity is going to occur online. I think that there are probably ways that we can figure that out. What I am saying, though, is that we should start with the violence rather than focusing on different narratives and grievances, which are widely shared. So it's really a question of whether you go broad to narrow or whether you start with actual threats of violence, criminal activity, and then fan out from there to find other people who might be involved. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sherman. Thank you, uh, uh, Senator Portman. Uh, just uh, for the uh, the record, uh, for our folks who are who are uh, online, uh, Senator Portman started with a fundamental question, which I think is important: Do we need INA? Uh, given all of the rest of the intelligence community, we heard uh, yes from the two witnesses that were here. I did not hear from the two witnesses, uh, Ms. Patel. Yes or no? Uh, the Mr. Senna, yes or no? I think INA plays a useful role in terms of its sharing of information and the networking uh, with state, local, tribal, and territorial. I, I guess I would say, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that that role could not be played by somebody else. Um, and we know that the FBI, for example, does have GTTFs, which perform a kind of a similar role in an investigative capacity. So while I recognize the importance of the role, I guess I, I'm not as committed to it necessarily being an in INA per se as, as the other commentators are. Okay, we can pursue that further. Uh, Mr. Senna, uh, yes or no, preferable? <laughs> Strong yes. Strong yes, very good. Senator Hassan, you are recognized uh, for your questions. Well, thank you, Chair Peters and Ranking Member Portman for this hearing. Thank you to all of our witnesses for being here today and for the service you've provided um, in multiple uh, arenas. Uh, quickly, General Taylor, I just wanted to give you a chance to comment on something that uh, Senator Portman and Ms. Uh, Cogswell discussed. Uh, would it help overall employee morale in INA if there was a nominee to head the office? Absolutely. Thank and uh, I would also say, Senator, that uh, INA's uh, morale was in the dumps when I took over yeah. uh, with uh, Secretary um, uh, Johnson, and we were able to improve morale by focusing on kind of basic 
uh, taking care of people, the things I've learned over yeah. 40 years in the military, uh, yeah. and to get people focused on mission. So it's not an impossible task, but leadership needs to focus on it and make it a priority. Thank you. Um, I also want to follow up. Uh, Senator Portman talked with both of you, uh, General Taylor and Ms. Cogswell, about uh, the role that INA plays in, in particularly combating TCOs, but I'd like you to expand a little bit on it. Um, the Office of Intelligence and Analysis is one of 17 entities within the larger intelligence community. So please take this opportunity uh, to briefly talk about um, how INA is suited to take advantage of its authorities and relationships to inform its own activities and the activities of the intelligence community as a whole, and how is its relationship with state, local, and tribal authorities different from other agencies? Why don't we start with you, General Taylor, and then to Ms. Coxwell. Well, as I said in my opening comments, uh, INA is the only intelligence agency uh, specifically chartered to uh, provide intelligence support to our state, local, tribal, and territorial partners, really as a result of 9-11. Yeah. And the fact that we had people in this country who were about to commit commit a terrorist act, and there was no way to loop in the 18,000 police organizations and 800,000 cops uh, to understand what the nature of that threat is. <laughs> and that's what INA and DHS has worked on over the years. So that's what makes it unique. Most of the IC cannot do work in the homeland. The FBI can from an investigative uh, perspective and counterintelligence perspective, and DHS, INA, but the rest of the IC is precluded from the kind of specific work, intelligence work that INA does uh, in the homeland. Thank you. And Ms. Cogswell. Uh, I agree with uh, everything that General Taylor said. I would add it is also uniquely situated within DHS. So it is partnered up with other elements who directly have mission responsibility to enact programs specifically to counter threats. So in addition to the threat in intelligence picture, the ability to wrap in policy and operational entities to help formulate direction and then work with counterparts, including at the state and local level, to exercise them. Critically important. Thank you. Uh, General Taylor, I want to turn to the issue of cybersecurity for a minute. We've seen a recent series of high-profile cybersecurity breaches and attacks against the federal government and critical infrastructure, and we don't expect that these threats are going to diminish. How can the Office of Intelligence and Analysis work with the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, otherwise known as CISA, to help prevent these attacks from happening? Well, I think the most important part is INA is already at CISA, uh, with about 30 of its analysts working directly with CISA and the uh, Computer Security Division to produce intelligence uh, coming out of the Einstein system. Yep. I believe CISA should have its own dedicated intelligence organization to assist uh, not only INA, but its director in formulating intelligence that's specific to the data that's collected by CISA. I also think that that would allow them a much more robust relationship with the National Security Agency. While NSA can't actually do domestic intelligence collection, it's an analytical capability I think is uh, important to our understanding of what the cybersecurity risk is and informing our partners in uh, the federal government and state and local and private sector uh, what uh, actions they need to take to address those issues. Thank you. Um, now I want to turn to the issue of terrorism threats, and we've talked a little bit about it this morning, but General Taylor, I am pleased that the Office of Intelligence and Analysis recently announced a new effort dedicated to analyzing the threat from domestic terrorism. I also remain concerned about the threats posed by international terrorists and homegrown violent extremists. So in your view, do you believe that the Office of Intelligence and Analysis has the capacity to adequately monitor the various terrorist threats? Absolutely. In conjunction with NCTC yep. and the FBI. It's, okay. It doesn't stand alone. This is a partnership. Uh, between the intelligence community, the FBI, and DHS and understanding the nature of the phenomenon we're seeing both in the homeland yeah. and overseas. And the uh, international threat has not diminished. Right. Uh, ISIS and Al-Qaeda continue to uh, threaten the U.S., and we need to keep a very clear eye on that threat 
as well as what we're seeing in, in the homeland as it's unfolded over the course of the last two or three years. Thank you. Um, Ms. Cogswell, you testified today about the importance of depoliticizing the intelligence process. What specific steps can the Office of Intelligence and Analysis take to accomplish this goal, and how can Congress assist? Thank you so much, Senator, for the question. Uh, in particular, as I thought about this type of particular issue, I very much liken it to right after 9-11, where we had kind of a whole of country kind of rethink about why we didn't see that coming. Yeah. What was our failure of imagination in that front? We put in place a number of activities, different processes post that threat. And part of it was starting with how we did the intelligence analysis itself the ability to have um, uh, different entities look at the problem from multiple different viewpoints, a diversity of viewpoint. The ability to have war gamings that looked at both the most likely scenario and the worst case scenario. The ability to have a community that knew how to receive that information and then take action based on the fact that there's a variety of potential options. Even if they didn't think the worst case was likely, they at least had discussed it and prepared for it. I think there's real opportunity in this space to take some of those lessons learned and practices and apply them here. Thank you. And Mr. Chair, would it be all right if I asked General Taylor to just quickly comment on that same issue, how we can uh, assist in depoliticizing the process? Absolutely. Proceed. Politics has no place in intelligence. Uh, it's the anathema, in my view, of solid intelligence collection, analysis, and reporting. Uh, and so during my tenure, or actually during my 50 years of doing this, um, speaking truth to power is what intelligence officials are supposed to do. Uh, and this, despite politics, uh, that's our job, and we need to do it and do it effectively. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Senator Hassan. Uh, Senator Rosen, you are recognized uh, for your questions. Uh, thank you, Chair Peters, uh, Ranking Member Portman. I appreciate the good questions and testimony already uh, given today and for everyone's uh, service to our nation. Um, but uh, General Taylor, I want to move over to uh, white uh, supremacist extremists that uh, that we have. As Chairman Peters has previously noted, ahead of January 6, DHS did not issue a threat assessment or a joint intelligence bulletin specific to the event. On March 3rd, Acting Undersecretary of Homeland Security for Intelligence, uh, Melissa uh, Smyslova, uh, told the committee, and I quote, more should have been done to understand the correlation between the information and the threat of violence and what actions were warranted as a result. And Elizabeth Newman, a former high-ranking DHS official, stated, and I quote again, but for reasons of fear, for reasons of fear, the department did not issue a formal report. So General Taylor, can you speak to whether there's a current fear to report either specifically towards domestic violent extremism as, as it results into, uh, turns into white supremacy uh, and or more broadly to other pertinent uh, threats that you might be assessing? Thank you for that question, Senator. I, I was not there, and therefore I can't um, get into the mind of the leadership of INA. Uh, what I would say is we have a process in this country around major events of producing threat assessments uh, culminating from the information that we've collected across the country. That didn't happen. Why it didn't happen, I can't say what's in the mind of the leadership that was in charge at the time, but I find it um, uh, difficult to accept the fact that that process was not um, applied to this event as with all other events uh, in our uh, threat analysis process. Uh, thank you. I, I Like you said earlier, intelligence uh, should be non-political because uh, we know that the rise in anti-Semitism is closely correlated with uh, the spread of extremist ideologies. Uh, the ADL's audit of anti-Semitic incidents recorded 331 anti-Semitic incidents in 2020 attributed, attributed to extremists. So how do you think that DHS intelligence could better account? Is there something that you might recommend uh, for us to work with them to better account uh, for this growing threat? You know, DHS uh, has partnerships across 
the country and state and local law enforcement and think tanks and all sorts of organizations that are monitoring the, this type of activity. I think continuing to coordinate uh, with those organizations and entities to get a better picture uh, consistently of uh, what's going on on the ground and what tactics, techniques, and procedures law enforcement can use, as well as the private sector. We have a relationship with uh, religious organizations uh, that we give information to about what these trends are and how they can protect themselves. So sustaining those relationships with up-to-date information about the nature of how the threat is unfolding, I think is the best uh, prescription for success in defending those communities that are targeted. Well, I think you're right, because you, and we do have good partnerships, uh, especially when it comes to our national fusion centers. So I'd like to ask Mr. Senna about the role that uh, fusion centers, uh, the really that they really play in protecting Americans from uh, terrorism. In my home state of Nevada, our fusion center has been at the forefront of tracking the domestic violent extremist threat, specifically emanating uh, from militias. The Southern Nevada Counterterrorism Center also played an important role in addressing the one October shooting back in 2017, the deadliest mass shooting in modern American history. So uh, on behalf of all of Nevadans, I want to thank our Fusion Center, their tremendous service to our state and our community. But uh, uh, Mr. Stana, you stated you were surprised that Fusion Centers didn't receive any specific information ahead of January 6th. Why do you think that is, that no specific threat information was shared? And uh, again, maybe you might speak to see if there's a fear to report uh, across the department. Uh, and thank you very much, uh, Senator, for that question. When we look at the National Network of Fusion Centers and our uh, coordination effort with INA, especially on you know, events that, uh, as was said earlier, information's online. So there are a lot of restrictions on how information is collected and analyzed. And you know, back in 2017, uh, the National Network of Fusion Centers in conjunction with the Criminal Intelligence Coordinating Council developed a real-time open source analysis uh, you know, guidance and recommendations. Uh, but within those roles and responsibilities, um, just because it is hate speech doesn't mean it's uh, extremist violent speech. So um, being able to collect the information is one key element to this. Um, having the personnel that can report on it and make it part of the reporting requirements is, is a key um, issue that we still continue to have. Um, prior to January 6, um, we as a network, a national network of fusion centers uh, held a call um, the Monday before the event, because we were concerned, um, we were worried, and um, that call was directly related to a request from the director of the Fusion Center in Washington, D.C., and we did have DHS INA personnel on that call uh, who did say that they would have personnel on site at the Fusion Center because there's not always personnel that are available to help them, and, uh, and you know, we tried to build that network to share that information. And I, I was surprised that uh, there wasn't anything developed at that time, but we were we were communicating in real time with them. So you know those that uh, need to talk about the threat need to share the information about the threat. We were actively working with the Washington D.C. Fusion Center to share information in real time, and the Washington D.C. Fusion Center um, had personnel with the U.S. Capitol Police to try to make sure that information was shared in real time. Um, there there are some issues with that real time information sharing. Um, one of the issues that we've got is that, you know, DHS INA is a Title 50 agency, intelligence community agency, but they don't have the law enforcement authorities uh, that other organizations have, um, as such as the FBI. And the Washington, D.C. Fusion Center at the time and, uh, was not considered a law enforcement agency. So they were restricted from having that law enforcement information, um, which hindered our ability to share information at times. So moving forward, though, and how do we look at this? I believe that using that real-time open source analysis guidance, um, you know, expanding the roles within our privacy, civil rights, and civil liberties policies that every fusion center has, along with the policies that INA have, they need to have that law enforcement authority, but they also need to have the capacity to access that data online to address those threats and to push information out in a timely manner to every agency that needs it to address specific terrorism, domestic violent extremists, and whatever major criminal threat is coming that we're seeing as a pre-indicator online. Well, thank you for that answer. I'm going to look forward to following up 
uh, with you on some things that we can do to enhance the communication, your uh, collaboration you're already doing, but uh, make it a little bit more robust so that we can stop any of these violent attacks before they start. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Senator Rose and uh, Senator Johnson. You are recognized for your questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, General Taylor, when you look at the title of the agency you, you once uh, headed, it's intelligence and analysis. And from my standpoint, the analysis is really all about gathering all that information and then trying to prioritize it so we can adequately address the threats that face this nation. I, I thought Ms. Patel uh, had a pretty good suggestion that you start with the violence. P pretty good way of prioritizing things. You know, what, what is the greatest threat magnitude? I mean, how, how many people could lose their lives? How much damage can be done? Um, I've always thought it was a little strange. The chairman's uh, focusing on white supremacists. Um, listen, I, I don't condone. I, con I condemn white supremacists. I condemn any act of violence. I don't categorize it, whether it's right wing, left wing. Um, I condemn violence. But the fact of the matter is we lose 70,000 people a year on drug overdoses. Uh, General Taylor, do you, do you have any idea how many deaths, how many murders uh, occur from drug violence? Gangs. I, I have no numbers, sir, but it, uh, it's an epidemic. Across it's, th the it's thousands, isn't it? It is. Across it's the thousands. I, I don't know what the current level of, of white supremacist killings, but I think it's in the hundreds. Again, condemn it uh, completely, but we're talking about thousands of drug-related murders every year, tens of thousands of drug-related overdoses, and... Now we're supposed to concentrate on domestic terrorism as, as the greatest threat. It's, it's again, it's not. Oh, right, 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 right now, the New York Times reported 160 different nationalities of people being picked up on the southern border over the last couple of months. Ms. Coswell, would you believe that's somewhat of a threat? I think that we have to continue to look at the processes by which people are showing up at the border. It is always possible uh, that these networks and routes can be used by those who intend to do us harm. So when, when we are clogging up our system with close to 6,000 apprehensions a day, General Taylor, when you were in the administration, uh, we had a humanitarian crisis, according to President Obama, of 2,000 people being apprehended a day. During 2018, 2019, it was a little over 4,000. Last couple of months, it's been 6,000 people per day on average almost. 6,000 people. What, what happens to our system when it's clogged up with 6,000 people? Doesn't that open up the border to additional drug trafficking? Doesn't that create opportunities for transnational criminal organizations to exploit it? Doesn't that open it up to other human trafficking of, let's call it, higher value targets to get in here that could uh, create acts of violence? I mean, isn't, isn't that, shouldn't we be concentrating on that as opposed to last week, it was surreal in this committee room. Secretary Marocas, first of all, blaming the previous administration for the crisis they created, and quite honestly, Senator Peter talking about, oh, it's, you know, the, the numbers are coming down, we're getting this under control. Uh, no, 6,000 people per day, and it's really not uh, being abated at all. Isn't that a threat? Isn't that an enormous threat? Absolutely. And it's a threat that we have to face along with the other threats that come at us from across the globe, from our international, uh, not just partners, but international adversaries. Look, we're, we're, in my view, the myriad of threats facing this country are significant and broad, and not just for the Department of Homeland Security, but for our state and local law enforcement uh, organizations, for the FBI, for the Department of Justice, in a coordinated effort to address. So, so again, my, my point, my point being, is we really ought to concentrate on the numbers and the magnitude of the threat. Listen, I, I condemned what happened here on January sixth, but I condemn as well the more than five hundred riots that occurred through the summer, including in Kenosha, Wisconsin. A couple, couple, you know, two dozen people murdered, 700 law enforcement officers injured, $2 billion worth of property damaged. Yet we all just want to move beyond that and let's just focus on January 6th. 
Sir, I and, and another thing that really concerns me is we just saw the uh, Colonial Pipeline cyber attack. I don't know if that's a shot across the bow, whether that's criminal organization uh, getting a little out of control of the Russian handlers and, and maybe going too far. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what that is. But I do know that no administration, as long as I've been serving here, has taken literally the vulnerability of our electrical grid seriously, not when it comes to potential EMP or GMD or cyber attack. We've seen what's happened now in terms of the vulnerability of the electrical grid to some of this green energy in Texas. In, in your time, both of you, uh, Ms. Coswell and, uh, and General Taylor, was DHS INA, were, were we looking at the vulnerability we are introducing into our infrastructure, like our electrical grid, with some of this, these green energy ideas? Ms. Cogswell, Cogswell I'll start with you. Um, I would say that both during my time with DHS INA and at my time at TSA, which, as you know, has responsibility uh, with, related, with relation to pipeline security, cyber was a considerate, considerable interest to us. We were focused on what we saw as the greatest potential threats, where their vulnerabilities were, how to work with the owners and operate, operators to conduct assessments and help them improve their basic security pipeline. We didn't select one opportunity threat over the other, but looking at it holistically across the board. General Taylor. Sure. Critically important to the uh, security of our country. 85% of the critical infrastructure in this country sits in private sector hands uh, that uh, makes the decisions about how to protect themselves. The sector coordinating councils that DHS has established over the course of the last 15 years have done yeoman work in working with those. But you know, we, ha we haven't made any move whatsoever, for example, to purchase and put in place large power transformers that are incredibly vulnerable to either an EMP attack or potentially a G GMD event. We haven't done it. We're, we're literally spending trillions of dollars we're, and proposing spending trillions more, and nobody's talking about doing something that prophylactic, that, that sensible in terms of protecting our infrastructure. Because I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm afraid we're focusing on you know, domestic terrorism that might kill a couple hundred people a year versus something that could really represent an existential threat. So again, my only point is I think we are completely, we have politicized the, these threat, uh, the threats we face, and we're not keeping our eye on the ball of the things that really represent a real th threat to this nation, which is right now border security is probably the number one, and we're ignoring that and denying reality. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Senator Johnson. Uh, Senator Ossoff, you are recognized for your questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our panel. General Taylor, where is there overlap based on your experience in government between uh, the role of INA and its responsibilities and the role and responsibilities of FBI's intelligence branch? I think that uh, they're inextricably uh, tied together uh, because of the nature of the FBI's authorities, the nature of INA's authorities. We can't do our job effectively uh, without the FBI, and the FBI relies on us to work with state and local partners on a consistent basis outside of the JTTFs to ensure that that intelligence becomes a part of uh, the overall intelligence that's available to, um, to the homeland for decision making going forward. Thank you, General. Appreciate that. You, you wrote an article uh, last August, I believe, on the Lawfare blog and noted, quote, INA has differentiated itself by informing audiences not usually served by the intelligence community, but you also noted that INA's mission overlaps with that of other agencies. Uh, where is there redundancy in the roles and responsibilities of uh, the agencies that have mission overlap with INA that could lead to inefficiency or a lack of clarity about who has principal responsibility for critical missions? I think when I wrote that article about mission overlap, it's, it's complementary, not uh, competitive. There are agencies that uh, collect information that's of value to, to INA and to INA's customers. And rather than INA going out trying to collect that in, in information independently, they should collaborate with those agencies to make sure that that information is available. So I don't see a whole lot of 
uh, overlap as long as uh, we are leveraging the rest of the IC and our law enforcement partners to ensure we're not duplicating uh, work that's already being effectively done by our partners. Thank you, General Taylor. And how do you think INA and the IC more broadly can do a better job of ensuring that there isn't duplicative or conflicting effort? I think that, that that's through uh, governance uh, of the intelligence community, governance of uh, the Department of Homeland Security, continual uh, cooperation or collaboration with our partners in the FBI, and certainly getting feedback from our state, local, tribal, and territorial customers of what they need and where those gaps are and addressing those gaps. Uh, how would you describe the breakdown of responsibility? And let me ask the question this way. Which agency has principal responsibility for developing and analyzing intelligence with respect to cybersecurity threats that both public and private sector entities face? Which agency is principally responsible for that? Whose job is it above all others to develop intelligence with respect to cybersecurity threats, please, General? Well, I think it's DHS has the primary responsibility in the homeland. That partnership is with CISA and uh, INA. But I also believe that there's a strong need for a close and collaborative relationship with the National Security Agency and the Cybersecurity Directorate of uh, our intelligence organizations to strengthen uh, the analytical capability uh, that informs our domestic uh, intelligence uh, efforts. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Patel, you mentioned in your testimony the need for INA to adhere to, quote, the highest standards when it comes to the protection of civil rights and civil liberties. Given the central role that INA plays sharing information, not just within the federal government, but also with state and local officials and uh, private sector actors, uh, you mentioned in your testimony instances during both Democratic and Republican administrations when, in your view, INA improperly collected or shared information uh, about U.S. persons. Uh, I'd, I'd like you to comment, please, on um, why you think there may be a tendency for INA to cross this line, in your view, uh, and how Congress might better define or constrain um, INA's roles, responsibilities, and authorities to ensure that the civil rights and civil liberties of Americans are protected. So it's not just INA. Uh, you know, most uh, intelligence agencies run into this problem. I mean, we've certainly seen this sort of starting with the Church Committee onwards, that there is um, always a temptation, uh, there's mission creep, um, and bias always plays a role as well in intelligence collection. And these things are, are really quite challenging to solve. And I think the best way really is to, um, to really strengthen the civil rights and civil liberties mechanisms that are within DHS and to strengthen congressional oversight. I think, you know, if you look at, there, there's a lot of different ways that you can do it. I've suggested a few in my testimony, including having DHS CRCL actually clear INA's analytical products, um, as well as increasing audits of um, INA products by DHS for CRCL purposes. But there are additional ways in which that office can broadly be strengthened, which have been proposed, you know, especially by people who previously worked in that office, such as, you know, direct reporting lines to Congress, greater congressional attention to uh, the things that uh, CRCL produces, insistence, insisting on really specific reporting about CRCL problems in DHS, as opposed to very generic stuff, which is what we've seen in a lot of the reporting. I think these are some of the ways in which um, INA can be more respectful of civil rights and civil liberties. Thank you, Ms. Patel. With, with my remaining time, uh, General Taylor, would you like to comment uh, in any way on Ms. Patel's analysis there? I think uh, Ms. Patel's analysis uh, is correct in the sense that strong civil rights, civil liberties oversight is key to effective intelligence collection and analysis in the homeland. Uh, I would, I'm not sure I would agree that I need CRCL to clear uh, 
intelligence products, I would see that as the responsibility of the intelligence officer who produced it, but to ensure that that product does not violate civil rights, civil liberties, or the policies of the department uh, would be my um, way of stating it. Thank you, General. Thank you, Ms. Patel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member. I yield. Thank you, uh, Senator Ossoff. Uh, the chair recognizes Senator Sinema for your questions. Uh, thank you, Chairman, for holding today's hearing, and I want to thank all of our witnesses for being here. It's critical that every decision the Department of Homeland Security makes about protecting our nation is backed up by robust analysis. We cannot protect our communities and secure our border without a strong office of intelligence and analysis. And that's especially true today when our nation and my state of Arizona are struggling to overcome a pandemic while also dealing with a crisis at the border. My first question is for General Taylor. The Office of Intelligence and Analysis is unique in the intelligence community with its task to coordinate with federal as well as state and local government and law enforcement entities to protect our country from threats, including pandemics. The COVID-19 pandemic created challenges for many. Based on your prior experience, how would the situation with the pandemic impact your recommendations to improve the overall effectiveness and coordination by the Office of Intelligence and Analysis with state and local governments and law enforcement? Senator, I uh, thank you for the question. I'm not sure uh, I understand um, what you're asking me to comment on. Could you clarify that a bit? So now that we have a pandemic that we're working through, would that impact any of your recommendations to improve the overall effectiveness and coordination of the Office of Intelligence Analysis with state and local governments and with local law enforcement? Look, I, I think pandemics and other sorts of disruptions occur every day. Uh, I don't think that changes the nature of how INA or our state and local partners approach their business. Maybe there's isolation and that sort of thing, but, you know, threats continue. Threats continue during pandemics, and we have to continue to focus our efforts on the collection of and understand and analysis of those threats even during a period of pandemic when people are uh, stuck at home and, and can't get out. Our adversaries see that as a uh, potentially an opportunity to, uh, to be exploited. My next question is for Mrs. Cogswell. As was previously discussed, transnational criminal pose a significant threat to our national security by facilitating drug trafficking, human trafficking, and violence at our southwest border. Our nation is also dealing with a migration challenge at the border, with CBP reporting record numbers of encounters, which of course diverts resources and focus. So what steps can the Office of Intelligence and Analysis take to more effectively respond to the ongoing TCO threats that will better engage law enforcement, CBP, and ICE's limited resources? And then second question is, does INA have the resources it needs to effectively address this threat? Uh, thank you, Senator, for the question. Um, with respect to the first element, I think that the, one of the more, most important elements that uh, INA, especially through the Mission Center construct, can bring to this discussion is providing the opportunity and floor for that strategic assessment, that sense of community uh, across all the actors to inform strategic discussions, strategic policy decisions, strategic decisions about resource allocation between various threats, as well as helping to clarify um, in those discussions, how best to uh, look for evidence about the impact their actions are taking and whether or not those, uh, those efforts have been successful. Uh, with, your, with your respect to your second point on resourcing, um, frankly, I, I think there is a, a very good question and discussion to be had uh, across a number of elements of uh, the intelligence and operational environment in which we're talking about. Uh, to look at whether or not the resources are commensurate to the threats we're currently facing. Um, and I thank you very much and look forward to further conversations by the committee in that regard. Well, thank you. Another question for you on this same general topic. We see a diverse population of migrants arrive at the southwest border in Arizona, including asylum seekers who are coming from dozens of countries. Given your past experience in this area, what unique challenges does this migration influx present DHS from an intelligence and analysis perspective? And what steps should the office take to ensure that criminals are not gaining entry into the United States? 
Uh, thank you very much for the question. So with respect to the first element, the unique aspects, um, DHS INA, I think it very much is in a support role uh, for the ongoing individual elements, uh, much more so a focus in assistance when we talk about sort of that strategic picture and the dynamicism uh, in terms of priorities uh, amongst a range of threats and characteristics. With respect to the, the uh, individual threats posed within the migrant communities themselves um, uh, and how to best assess and screen, there is a robust screening architecture already in place. Uh, the key here is ensuring that there is the time and resources dedicated and available to ensure that screening occurs. Uh, one of the things I found most important over time is looking at not only how tools can be assist, uh, in assistance to the various entities performing these functions, but also some of the analysis that, go, that goes along looking at the various encounters themselves. What can we learn uh, based on that in terms of routes, trends, practices, tactics being used, funding, whether or not they are using different types of travel documents that hadn't been previously identified. These are some of the most important things that help us better deploy our resources and assets. Well, thank you. Um, and a follow-up on this question for Ms. Patel. Do you have specific recommendations to help maintain the right balance between security, privacy, and civil liberty concerns when it comes to the work that INA does to combat these TCOs and identify border challenges? Thank you for the question, Senator. I think um, I've tried to identify those, which are basically that I think it's important that we get focus on violence. Uh, my concern is that there is a tendency to really broaden the aperture through which we look at threats so that we're looking across you know, different narratives and grievances on social media in an effort to winnow it down. And what I would suggest is that instead we identify violent actors uh, which we have done, uh, you know, certainly over the last several months as well, and then fan out from there uh, in, a, in an effort to really constrain INA to focus its work on the most dangerous people. Thank you. I appreciate that. Mr. Chairman, I do have another uh, question for Mr. Cena, but since my time's expired, I'll submit it for the record. I yield my time back, and I thank you for this hearing. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Sinema. Uh, well, uh, as we start wrapping up here, I have uh, uh, one more question here, and actually for Mr. Senna. Uh, we've talked a, a great deal here at this hearing about the unique aspect of INA and, and how they share information with uh, state, local, tribal, territorial uh, governments. And with your work with uh, fusion centers, of course, is the, is the center of all of that. And you mentioned in your uh, opening testimony that you had some specific uh, actions that you would recommend to strengthen uh, the sharing of relevant, timely, actionable intelligence information across the, those centers. You could share with the committee uh, some of those actionable ideas uh, that, we, uh, uh, that we should consider. Absolutely. Uh, you know, one of the biggest pieces is that lack of uh, the personnel resources that are on the ground, uh, whether it's intelligence officers, uh, uh, collections managers, re reports officers, uh, we've got to have people in the local area, in the local regions who are across the country um, that have the capacity to share information in real time and to, to work closely with uh, the FBI field intelligence group and the Joint Terrorism Task Force and in that fusion center co-located environment. We need technology. Um, right now, the Homeland Security Information Network is riding on technology that is, uh, you know, in some cases, 18 years old. Um, you know, we need that capacity to have tools and resources that are easily accessible by all of our, our leaders out there, um, not just the folks in the fusion centers, but all of our partners. We also need um, folks that are on the ground to help support that uh, privacy, the civil rights, the civil liberties training. And uh, INA can play a pivotal role in that capability. Um, and we also need that capacity to have you know, personnel on the ground that when we run into, whether it's bureaucratic or whatever the hurdles may be, um, the fact that we have centers right now that can't get the critical data they need to prevent uh, terrorist acts, to prevent major criminal threats, um, it, it's abysmal. And it's, you know, here we are almost 20 years later and we don't have that capacity. So having advocates there, I often say that um, I get more done by having a DHS regional director three doors down from me um, than I do with many of the calls that we have with Washington, in Washington, D.C., because that's where the rubber meets the road. That's where things get done. It's done at the local level because that's where the threats are. So I see that uh, formation of INA pivoting 
um, what has happened over the last uh, you know number of years, um, where the focus has been uh, not as much on the state, local, and tribal territorial partners who are at the local level and looking at more of a, a larger intelligence community framework. There are lots of folks in the intelligence community that do a great job um, within their, their avenues of what they do. But the real strength of DHSINA is with their state, local, tribal, and territorial partners. It really is, because that's where the information's at. That's where the threat is. That's where we're dealing with the opioid and uh, overdose epidemics. That's where we're dealing with transnational uh, criminal organizations. That's where we're dealing with domestic violent extremists and every other violent extremist. And having the personnel there, we can't do this with a little over 100 people. We've got to have more folks in the field. And I agree, the uh, the mission center idea um, is great, but it needs to incorporate uh, those state, local, tribal, territorial partners to be effective. And INA, um, in their unique role, has the ability to be our champion for that state, local, tribal, territorial community. And I think that's where they need to be uplifted too, but they need the resources um, from Congress to make sure that they have the capacity to achieve what they should be and what they were designed to be after September 11th. Thank you, sir. Well, thank you. Thank you for that answer. And, uh, and thank you uh, again to all of our uh, witnesses uh, here today for giving us uh, your time and uh, your expertise uh, this morning. Uh, this hearing is a part of our committee's bipartisan effort to examine the uh, security and intelligence uh, failures on January 6th as well as to identify what reforms are needed to address uh, the rising threat of domestic terrorism uh, generally across uh, the country. Our witness, uh, witnesses today focused on the importance of INA and how it needs to provide DHS uh, and its partners, state and local governments, law enforcement, and the private sector with more actionable intelligence. We also discussed the unique position of INA as a domestic-focused intelligence agency and the need to ensure that we protect the privacy, the civil rights, and the civil liberties as they work to execute uh, their mission. I certainly look forward uh, to working uh, with uh, my colleagues as we continue to examine how to combat the rise of domestic terrorism, including white nationalism and anti-government uh, violence. And certainly INA uh, is the member of the intelligence community that is uh, uniquely situated and suited to interact with both state and local uh, enforcement, focus on strategic issues uh, rather than specific law enforcement uh, investigations, and leverage uh, its uh, existing domestic authorities to help us uh, address uh, that threat. So with that, uh, the hearing record uh, will remain open for 15 days until J June 2nd at 5 p.m. for the submission of statements and questions uh, for the record. This hearing is now adjourned.